Hey, this is Off Leash with Eric Prince. I'm Mark Serrano. Today we got to talk about Israel. All right, Eric, this is the first we've met since the attack on Israel. I got to go back though, before we get into what transpired October 7th, 2023, I want to go back to the early origins of Gaza being self-governing, uh, at least, you know, Hamas taking over. Clearly, this was uh, uh, a uh, uh, aimed, Israel aimed at trying to make peace in the region back in 2005, 2006, when Gaza was allowed to be self-governing. Uh, it looks like that, you know, blew up in their face. But what can you tell us about that deal? What was intended? Was it just a disaster from the beginning? Because there's been nothing but attacks from, from Hamas uh, on the people of Israel ever since that deal was struck. Take us back. So it had, Gaza had been occupied by the IDF and maintained security there. And then um, they agreed to pull out and to let them have an election uh, that was pushed by Condi Rice, the Bush administration person. An election. An election. <laughs> and Hamas was elected with like 90% of the vote. And sure enough, Hamas, um, you know, their stated goal is to annihilate the state of Israel. and. Um, uh, it's been compounding bad since then to the point of them even ripping up. I mean, they, they even had the gall to post videos of them ripping up European donated water infrastructure to use it to make rockets. And so the concrete, the electricity, the, the infrastructure that's supposed to be there for the betterment of the civilian population has been all militarized. There's 300 miles of tunnels. And they managed to catch a very complacent Israeli security force, you know, asleep, but literally is, asleep but, at the switch. But Israel was clearly under pressure from the media, from the world back in 05, 06, 07, when they struck this deal. So they said, okay, we're gonna let Gaza, uh, basically govern Gaza. Hamas competes in an election, takes over with 90 plus percent of the vote. And then almost immediately, they start shooting rockets over at civilians in Israel, and this is repeated. This pattern is repeated sure. year after year after year. It, 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 it really speaks to what a joke the international diplomatic community is, that um, instead of allowing one side to win and one side to not win or to be defeated, this idea that uh, um, a group of people whose stated goal is to annihilate its neighbor, um, is that you're actually going to make peace and, and they're going to be reformed. Right, so but doesn't it say a lot on Israel's part that that they would take Gaza and they'll say okay fine we're going to build a fence we're going to secure it but you can you know go ahead and and live in peace over on your side of the fence and they've the, the, it's just been a terrorist haven throughout i mean this is you know we're almost at 20 years since Gaza was allowed to govern themselves it, what a what a misguided notion that was what was what were they thinking back then it's the same um, uh, neocon idea that um, uh, diplomacy is going to uh, conquer all, or is going to conquer is the wrong word. Diplomacy will, right. will be the balm that heals everything. It's not. And sometimes uh, one side needs to win and one side needs to be defeated. And clearly that's the case this time because, you know, sadly, I don't think all Palestinian people in Gaza are hell-bent on destroying Israel and killing Jews and, and committing atrocities, but a lot of them are. And, and so if that's allowed to continue, this level of depravity and evil and, and attacks uh, will spread, not just uh, against Israel, but uh, seeing the widespread protests all over in major cities speaks to, to, to how um, malignant this cancer is. But this is so Ariel Sharon was responsible for this deal back in 05, okay? And he said back then, the changing reality in the country and the region and the world required of me a reassessment and change of positions. We cannot hold on to Gaza forever. More than a million Palestinians live there and double their number with each generation. We are disengaging from Gaza because of demography. I mean, Think of how crazy that notion was back then, if, you, if looking back. Did people recognize at that time, even in the diplomatic community, how ill-fated a decision that was? 
uh, <clears throat> clearly not. And, and they're all suffering for it. And, and when you look at the losses sustained, um, not just on October 7, but the losses they will sustain going forward in trying to clear it out, it would be like if the U.S. lost 25,000 people on 9-11. So if you, if you do the, um, the statistical comparison. So right. it's, it's a, a massive setback, a massive shock. That in it, in it, and I think it's a very important lesson in the United States that complacency kills and that uh, the enemy always gets a vote. Um, the, the relative calm compared to the last couple of years where a lot of people from Gaza were getting work permits, they were coming into Israel, they were working, they were making money, and it was quiet. And I think the, the security officials in Israel were literally asleep at the switch. Okay, but here's what's shocking about that. Check this list out. You had, uh, you know, since Hamas took over Gaza, there have been several conflicts in, in all the years since, 18 years or so, uh, including two wars. So this has included Operation Hot Winter 2008, Gaza War of 2008-2009, Operation Cast Lead, Clashes in 2010, Operation Returning Echo 2012, Operation Pillar of Defense 2012, Gaza War of 2014, Operation Protective Edge, Clashes in November 2018, Clashes of 2019, March, May, and November. The Al-Aqsa Incident in 2021, Operation Breaking Dawn 2022, the Al-Aqsa Crisis of 2023. I mean, what's the pattern and how all on earth the, could you be All of those are half measures. Complacent. At, at, no, at none of those points do they actually go in and clean out Gaza. Um, Hamas survived every one of those operations. So it might have been a punitive raid, but it was not a finishing raid. And okay, so, 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 so Hamas shooting rockets, killing uh, Israeli civilians, and every time Israel would respond with, they got the Iron Dome, obviously a defensive measure, they would respond with a volley of their own rockets and never going on the ground. Is that, is that the picture? Yes. Am I oversimplifying that? Correct. And so now the question is, you listed what, 10 or 12 different um, um, punitive raids, which are all half measures. The question is, are they gonna be able to do, to, to clean it out this time? You know, it, it's like if you get a cut, and if you don't get all the, um, the dirt out of the wound, it keeps getting infected. And that's exactly the case now. I think the Biden administration will continue to restrain and suppress um, the Israelis from really cleaning out Gaza and ending Hamas like it should be. Um, a, uh, a friend of mine saw um, Prime Minister Netanyahu recently, who kind of complained that, the, uh, that the, the, Joe Biden said, don't start a major war in the Middle East and my administration. Naturally. That's what, that's what his complaint was. So right. talk about passing the buck for the administration. Instead of taking ownership on a litany of failed deterrence, starting with Afghanistan and all the other places, and then right after October 7, there was like a dozen different attacks on U.S. interest and U.S. forces in the rest of the Middle East by the Iranians. And what are we doing? So it is a massive fail of deterrence. It is a um, it is a cauldron of danger because of this ability to 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 go not just to Lebanon, but to uh, full on war. I mean, the Iranians will bring hybrid war to a lot of places, and they can even bring it to the United States. Think about this terminology: don't start a war during my administration. Start? Don't start yeah. a war? Yeah. Every all you know the the terminology of the left in the United States and the media is Israel Delu starting war as opposed it's, to defending themselves. It's delusion based. Right. They're defending, everything they're doing right now is a defensive measure, correct? Correct. And all of our, look, all our allies, Israel's been a close ally. If we're not, if it's just uh, lip service and not giving the Israelis the diplomatic um, leeway they need to actually go and fix the problem, it's gonna continue and continue and continue. All right, so at Off Leash, we don't avoid the difficult questions. We got to ask the question, how did this happen on October 7th with the greatest, one of the greatest uh, militaries in the world in intelligence? How did this happen? We'll be right back to talk about that. Imagine a technology company built to restore your privacy, not take it away. You and your phone are constantly bombarded with tracking, surveillance, propaganda, and digital attacks. Even big tech companies claiming to protect privacy create their own back doors. 
Unplugged restores what's been lost, starting with a messenger, a VPN, a mobile antivirus. The Unplugged app bundle gives you back what's rightfully yours. Unplugged, restore your privacy. We're back. We're talking about Israel uh, at Off Leash with Eric Prince. Eric, I, I've got a lot of questions about how October 7th happened. Let's start here. Who's Hamas and how did they do it? Hamas is the, uh, the local affiliate of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is a very radical um, Palestinian. It's really, the, it's really the, the successor of Black September. Black September, if you remember, uh, in the early 70s, they were the guys that um, took uh, Israeli hostages at the 1972 Olympics in Munich, mm -hmm. uh, ended up killing them all. Israel responded aggressively and professionally to that, actually sending hit teams to go and, and to kill all the Black September people that made that attack possible. That was I, the forerunner of the Muslim Brotherhood, correct. Black September. Black September. Right. Well, no, Muslim Brotherhood even before then. Black September, very much a Palestinian um, radical uh, uh, Sunni terrorist organization. Now it's Hamas. And Hamas is the governing entity of Gaza Strip and has been since uh, the mid 2000s. And so they have been collecting money from the Muslim Brotherhood. The biggest funder of the Muslim Brotherhood is the state of Qatar. They kind of play both sides. They, they cynically take a US base years ago to buy off the US and to delude the US into thinking that uh, they're friends. And uh, they've been funding every radical Sunni organization. They did in Syria, they did in, um, in Somalia. I think they even started an insurgency in Mozambique because Mozambique had a huge uh, natural gas discovery. Okay, the major national income for Qatar is natural gas. And by 2025, about 70% of their long-term gas contracts expire, which means uh, their gas would be sold in the open market. So for a few million dollars, I believe they even started the insurgency in Mozambique to, to, to knock out or at least delay Mozambique gas coming online. Oh, because so Qatar, if they're good at anything, it must be PR. I mean, they got the World Cup last they, year, right? They, they bought the World Cup. They bought it. They, they, it's openly, they bribed for it. Right. And they did it. They have an, uh, an overt propaganda arm in Al Jazeera, which, which sends a very different version of reality mm -hmm. to the, the, the and, and, and they really use that to inflame the Arab street in Tunisia, in Egypt, in Jordan, um, all over the world. So it is, um, it's not just Hamas that's a problem. You have a Muslim Brotherhood problem and, and, a, and obviously Iran uh, uses Hamas as a proxy arm. The Muslim Brother, this is one place where radical Sunni Islam and radical Shia Islam cooperate in, uh, in helping, funding, training, supplying terrorist organizations to attack Israel and their hatred of Jews and to attack anything that uh, is Western society. So uh, Hamas clearly uh, is funded, but not just by Qatar and, and Iran. Nope. Also, money the, from the U.S. by the State Department, from Europe, by NGOs, yes, and it's humanitarian, right? Correct, humanitarian aid, which is a joke. Well, again, if if and it's it's the timing of this. There's been a lot of, you know, Hamas is an effective terrorist organization. They're not a great governance organization, and they've had a lot of protests by people in Gaza against their rule, against the corruption, against the incompetence, and against the diversion of humanitarian resources into making more and more weapons. And so this is a perfect time for Hamas to, uh, to reassert themselves. And, and by doing this, uh, and, and don't kid yourself, Iran was very much behind this. Mm -hmm. uh, and by doing this, they, um, the Abraham Accords, where Israel established diplomatic relations with UAE, with Bahrain and Morocco, mm -hmm. were about to do so with Saudi Arabia. Right. This puts that all on, uh, on hold, and if not, uh, for, for a few years. That was a significant motivator absolutely. in Hamas's timing, correct? Yes. I mean, the Saudis and Israel are very close to cutting a deal. Yes. And they were, <clears throat> they were actually extremely close uh, six months ago uh, and would have had the deal already, 
where, except the Saudis just asked for a continuation of the same kind of security agreements that uh, the Saudis have had with the United States for decades. But the Biden people started hemming and hawing and said, well, it's a different world. It's complex. We don't know if we can do that. And that's when um, the Saudis cut off the negotiations. They went and, and called the Iranians and reestablished diplomatic relations with them. And they brought the Chinese in at the last minute just as an extra FU to America. The Chinese had nothing to do with the negotiation, but that's absolutely what happened. And that's why, um, you know, the, the Iranians are really good at, at hybrid surrogate warfare and applied a lot of pressure um, on the southern border of Saudi Arabia with Yemen, with the Houthis there, and with other internal subversion inside. And so MBS, the, the ruler of Saudi Arabia, made that deal with the Iranians because, largely because of Biden administration incompetence. So wait a minute. Donald Trump's first trip overseas was to the Middle East, where he addressed 100 leaders. And he was able to unite them around what we share in common, which was Iran, the threat that Iran represents to the region. And here we are, years later, seven years later, and you're telling me Saudi is now in alliance with Iran because of the incompetence of the Biden administration, and the Biden administration has not even changed course? Not full alliance, but they reestablished diplomatic relations. Yeah, but that's a yes. step in that direction. And, 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 and then <laughs> uh, to, to put an exclamation point on that, you have Iranian proxy Houthis firing cruise missiles at U.S. Navy warship in the Red Sea, which the U.S. Navy fortunately shot down, but that's a, that is a long way. I'm not trying to politicize this. I'm just saying deterrence matters, credibility matters, and our U.S. credibility and deterrence has steadily eroded. Right. Well, you, so you give the administration the benefit of the doubt up to the point where Saudi goes ahead and reestablishes diplomatic relations with Iran. But how about since then? You don't change course. You don't pivot. You don't say, we better get this deal cut between Saudi and Israel right away. That's a good question. That's, right. That, 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 it, it's fair. And so, so I, I, I've said at the beginning of the Biden administration that I, I felt like we were going to be in for another another Carter administration. Mm -hmm. So if you remember, it's 1975, Vietnam collapses. Helicopters off the rooftop of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Saigon. And then um, a number of communist insurgencies take over in various countries. The, um, uh, the U.S. consulate in um, Pakistan is burned. Some of Amer Americans are burned to death in mm -hmm. that process. And then the Iranian hostage crisis 56 American hostages for 444 days. The OPEC's Soviet, got us by the balls throughout right. the entire time. And the President time. of the United States gets on TV and says, um, turn down your thermostats and wear a sweater because mm -hmm. it's not going to get any better. We have a malaise. Uh, the malaise, right? And I think that's kind of, uh, it's part two right now with inflation. The economy is not in great shape. Um, interest rates. Interest rates are climbing. It's really choking off small businesses. They, they can't get access to capital and a litany of foreign policy setbacks that are going to continue and compound over the next 18 months. And hostages, by the way, in American hostages in Gaza. And now hostages, yes. So let's go to October 7th. Israel's defense forces, vaunted defense forces, intelligence agencies vaunted throughout all the world. How in the hell could this have happened? And by the way, excuse me, Hamas must be, what's some look at October 7th thinking, Wow, there's no, we, we exceeded our expectations wildly, would you, would you say? Tragically. Yes. I, tragically, yes, they did. Look, it was, uh, it's the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, another surprise attack on Israel, uh, only this was a, uh, a, another holiday at the end of that Yom Kippur period. I think the Israelis got very complacent, and they depended a lot on, too much on signals intelligence, listening to the other guy's phone calls. And I think what the uh, Hamas did is they said, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Everyone that's used to talking like this, keep doing. And they probably formed a completely separate cell and went completely offline with no electronic communications, etc. But the thing that shocks me is you even see videos now of Hamas training camps inside Gaza, including a mock-up of a kibbutz. Like, how are you going to breach the fence? How are you going to, how are you going to flow through? Um, even uh, gates and, um, and samples of Israeli military bases inside Gaza where Hamas was training. How the Israelis missed that is 
really shocking to me. I mean, don't they have satellite surveillance that would pick that pick up on on that you, training? You'd think. I mean, hell, you could probably see that on Google Earth if you look close enough. Right. So I, it that's was shocking to me, but complacency clearly. So uh, they kills been, a lot of them. Has, has, has Israel just been focused north? I mean, is that the problem that they were complacent in the south because uh, they're so focused in the on their northern look, border? Look, and here's the thing: it's not just. Um, <clears throat> can we get uh, map? Yep. Two, please. Okay, so here's a map of uh, of the entire Middle East, mm -hmm. and if you look at the northern border of Israel, you have Lebanon, mm -hmm. but of course, um, to the northeast, you have the Syrian border. <laughs> And, and so Israel not just faces a, a challenge from, and, 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 and this is an important point to make, that Gaza Strip, they fired 5,000 or so rockets right. into Israel. On the 7th of October. On the 7th. Right. And Iron Dome, which is developed to shoot down enemy incoming rockets, um, it has a brilliant battle management system. So there's a radar and you detect the, um, the trajectory and this brain actually calculates uh, where that missile came from and where it's going to land. And it immediately decides, okay, if it's going to land in a field, let it go. It's going to land in a school or an apartment building, shoot it down. It immediately generates a fire solution, launches a $50,000 rocket, missile, okay. sorry, intercepts that rocket. Destroys it. And it does it with about 90% 90, 90 effectiveness, which is spectacular. But, even, but, but Hamas launched so many rockets, 5,000 that it overwhelmed the system in many cases. In the north, from, from the Lebanon border in the Sheba Farms, Beka Valley area, is reputed to be between 100 and 150,000 rockets and much, much longer range. Whereas Gaza, which has tighter, harder logistics to smuggle stuff in right. uh, through small tunnels or through um, even by the sea, through Lebanon, they have direct access, and that's why the Iranians, for the last decades, have been focusing on completing the Shia Crescent. So you can go from Iran through their, their dominated controlled areas, because you've heard of Hezbollah, the party of God, the, the Iranian proxy in Lebanon. Right. Well, in, um, in Iraq, it's called Hashdashabi. So really, because of American blundering and incompetence, Iran has completely subjugated Iraq. Iran still decides or approves who's going to be the prime minister of Iraq. So <clears throat> control there, logistics access through Syria, because of the, um, uh, the civil war they had inside Syria, Sunni versus Shia, uh, because of the Alawite president, um, Assad, it's like a, uh, the Alawites are a Shia uh, minority and, and they're only like 3 to 5% of the population, tiny. The Sunnis are the, most, the majority there. And because of the civil war, Iran intervened and, and backed up the Assad government. And because of that, the Iranians stayed in place. And so now Israel faces Iranians on the Lebanon border, Iranians on the Syrian border, and now uh, obviously Hamas is their surrogate of Iran, firing at them from Gaza. So it's almost from three fronts. All right, so. So enemies on all sides, but except Jordan, understood. That's fortunately, the, that's fortunately right. So that's almost the entire eastern border. But so let me ask you this: all of this takes funding. When Joe Biden came into office, he basically shut down American uh, domestic energy production as much yep. as he could. Ended the pipeline. Uh, took it off federal lands. And at the same time, he lifted the sanctions, very, very effective sanctions on Iran, enabling them to sell oil. So you've got this dynamic where all of a sudden we limit production here so the price of oil goes up. And at the same time, Iran's able to sell it. So they've made, have they not, tens of billions of dollars in the last three years, and they're pumping it all into these proxies. Indeed, this is, these this is, it, it is Iran's goal to re to reinvigorate the Persian Empire. And yet, it's all worth it because they're gonna cut a new nuclear deal with us. Is that the thinking? Um, I look, I think the Biden team wants to cut domestic oil because of their green- Climate agenda. Their green climate agenda. Right. Ignoring the fact that nature hates a vacuum, someone else is gonna produce energy um, with the Iranians. So they've, they've, they've allowed the Iranians to turn on the spigot. 
They even paid, uh, what, $6 billion for the release of some American hostages. An, a staggering, staggering sum. Well, we swapped uh, five hostages for five hostages, plus our $6 billion. Plus $6 billion. I think so. Um, but money's behind it all, right? Yes. If Iran had not had the uh, sanctions lifted and they could make money hand over fist, maybe we wouldn't be here right now. Correct. And, and the, 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 the lie, the delusion that continuing to... Look, the, the Iranians are a very deliberate society. They can put a thousand stitches into a square inch of a Persian rug. And so they're playing a, a 3D chess while the Biden administration is kind of playing checkers. And they're getting rolled again and again and again. So it's, it's shocking to me how people that are supposed to be the foreign policy experts, that uh, you know, the adults are going to be in charge again, Clearly, uh, the U.S. is getting rolled, and this is becoming very, very dangerous because now what can happen is if, if Israel goes in to clean out Gaza, the images, of course, will be terrible because even though um, the Israel gave an order to move to the lower half to, to evacuate all the civilians from, uh, from Gaza City, right. which is kind of the, the main concentration there, some civilians will stay. And to try to dig through a highly dense urban combat with, I don't care how good their tanks are and armored personnel carriers, driving in to prelaid uh, roadside bombs, ambush lanes with, with RPGs and missiles and all the other stuff that I'm sure, because Hamas has been preparing this for years, knowing that there'd be an incursion. And so if the Israelis go in, and they, even if they make it two miles inside of Gaza, there's 300 miles of tunnels that Hamas can use to constantly flank and constantly resupply um, their forces there and constantly encircling Israeli forces. And so if the Israelis go in and they're not successful and they lose hundreds, if not thousands of forces, just surviving is a victory for Hamas at that point. Incredible. So it's, there, there is no substitute for complete victory on this. And, and of course, the... The Muslim Brotherhood and Al Jazeera and the rest will be beating the drums of, of making Hamas the victims instead of the aggressors, ignoring the fact that they picked this fight. They chose to go in on a holiday weekend and slaughter people in their homes and slaughter people at a peace music concert. Hundreds. Hundreds. So yeah. um, it's bad. And so as that ground attack happens, then you have you have that great risk of significant uh, rocket. Uh, and, and again, the Iranians make uh, rockets now staged in Sheba farms in the southern Lebanon right. that can reach uh, at least half the country Incredible. and overwhelm Iron Dome. And so Israel as a country will take a real pounding from those kind of rockets. And only three years ago, we had peace in the region. Let's, let's come right back uh, to wrap up this segment. It, this is incredible stuff about Israel, and we're getting it from the expert off leash with Eric Prince. We'll be right back. Imagine a technology company built to restore your privacy, not take it away. You and your phone are constantly bombarded with tracking, surveillance, propaganda, and digital attacks. Even big tech companies claiming to protect privacy create their own back doors. Unplugged restores what's been lost, starting with a messenger, a VPN, a mobile antivirus. The Unplugged app bundle gives you back what's rightfully yours. Unplugged. Restore your privacy. All right, we're back. Talking Israel. Eric, how did Hamas leverage technology on October 7th to, to basically subdue the Israeli Defense Forces? Because, by the way, people, unfortunately, who were under attack thought that IDF would be in within 30 minutes, an hour, and unfortunately, it was many hours. How did they use technology to their advantage? I think when the, uh, when the post-op of, the, of this disaster is done, I think the main, um, the main source of intel from, um, for Hamas was cell phone data. Okay? Literally the ad data that, uh, that most phones drag around with them now, if you have a Google or an, Andro a Google or an Apple operating system, you're right. dragging around an advertising ID which is used for advertisers to know where you go, what you buy, who you call, and what you browse. How does Gaza access that data? Huh. Anybody with a credit I mean, card and $1,000 can buy that. So they could buy 
They, it, so uh, a, a front organization or even an embassy up in Europe that was fronting for a, a company that wanted to sell stuff into Israel could have bought the cell phone data. And so what that would show is each of the Israeli bases, because you can, you can overlay the cell phone data, it will be lots of little dots. And it becomes like breadcrumb trails. And you can see where that dot goes. And you can see where they're bedding down, where the gates are, where the operating center is, even down to each of these um, kibbutzes in the south, where the people are moving, where they're gathering for dinner, because you can, you can watch it over time. And so if they're coming together for a, for a, um, a Shabbat meal on Friday, you know where they're going to be. So literally watching that cell phone data, the exhaust carried around by, by that phone, it's the same way that uh, the feds ra wrapped up anybody that was on Capitol Hill on January 6th. That was cell phone data. Same exact yes. technique. Yes. So I think it will cause a, a rethinking of, of anybody that's serious about their security or their whereabouts, whether they're a government employee, a security official, or just someone that cares to, to keep their, mo their movements by themselves. That's why we did uh, this thing called Unplugged. Right. Um, so how does that help me? So this if phone, I'm unplugged, this I can't is a, get detected. This is a new phone, completely unique, separate of the Google and Apple universe, but it doesn't have an advertising ID. So our operating system intentionally blocks the hooks that come in from apps to keep them from harvesting your data so that you know where you go, what you buy, who you call, what you browse is your business, not the phone company. So if all Israel had unplugged on October 7th, what would that have done to Hamas's I will almost guarantee that, that whether it's the, the people living on the kibbutzes, but especially the 19, 20, 21 year old kids that are serving in the IDF, if they're not on duty, they're on their phones and on social media. And, and, and that cell phone data was tracked, collected, and used for targeting by Hamas. Okay, so have Hamas- This phone, unplugged, yep. prevents that from happening. So if Hamas is going in, yep, go ahead. It allows you to communicate securely, and you're not leaving that breadcrumb trail of everywhere you're going to be exploited by big tech uh, or, or adversaries. Your timing's extraordinary with the release of Unplugged. Uh, afraid so. Right. Yes. So uh, how much of that is real-time data? So if Hamas is going in 6.30 a.m., paragliders are coming in, uh, they're breaching the fence. It's, no, it's, it's going to be backward looking. Okay. So you can buy the data and look where that phone has been going for the last 90 days. Okay. But what it really establishes is pattern of life. Because if you watch previously 10 weekends, you kind of know how many people are going to be in the command room at this hour. How many people are going to be in the barracks. And you're also going to know exactly where the gates are. If you watch some of the videos, some of the GoPro videos that, were on the, that Hamas used, you actually see guys breach the fence, they go through, and there's one guy who whips out a map and say, okay, go to that door, it should be unlocked. Why does he know it's unlocked? Because if there's a lot of people flowing through it, and there's no pause as they're going through, obviously it's unlocked. So they, they did a very clever job. Unfortunately, the enemy always gets a vote. And so despite the technological brilliance of the IDF, they got very, very complacent, thinking that their enemy couldn't pull something like that off. And they did, because, in a big way. Because they're underestimated. Because uh, most people would look at Hamas and they think, well, it's just a you know, ragtag. You know, these guys hang out trucks, uh, right, with, uh, with heavy... Uh, uh, look, I'm gun. sure, look, the Iranians provided plenty of technical assistance, I'm sure. Okay. And, and, and when you look at what cell phone data did, what the Russians used in, already in eastern Ukraine in 2014 when they invaded, they actually uh, had gathered up cell phone numbers um, of people operating in certain areas that they thought were troops. And then when the attack was on, they, the Russians falsely sent all those phone numbers that have been communicating with who they thought were soldiers, a message that said, your loved one has been killed. So, so what does that loved one immediately do? Wow. Calls the loved one to see if they're okay. So immediately the Russians, within minutes, see a few hundred phones light up in a certain area, and they know, aha, there's the barracks. Bam, that's where, the, that's where the rockets and artillery, they wiped out hundreds of Ukrainian soldiers that way. And so cell phone data is deadly. If you, if you allow it to be, be collected on you. So that's a fail, clearly. And I think, I think people are going to have to reevaluate how, how leaky they are of their own personal data. But it's a new tool of war. I mean, that's extraordinary. Sure.
Well, look, it, it, it's, 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 it's delusion to think that you carrying around an electronic messaging device that's emitting electrons and, and sharing information that doing it in an uncontrolled way cannot be exploited by the enemy. Clearly, this has been this case. And now, here, yeah. Now, when all, when all else failed, right, the IDF was supposed to show up. You'd think the reaction force would be there in 30 minutes or an hour. Right. The kibbutzes that had the most motivated, uptight security officers that had that kind of a, a home, home defense unit. Right. Those are the ones that didn't get slaughtered. But the ones that were complacent, where their guns were locked up, where they didn't train together, they had, they absolutely, you know, had a disaster. So they didn't know. And so this is gonna this is gonna make the Israeli government really think rethink. You know, we have a Second Amendment. We take it for granted here. This this argument, the left of why do you ever need an M an AR fifteen? Well, because sometimes if there's a mass attack, and your security forces are not there to protect you, police or military, definitely the case here as well. Seeing the mass gangs of Hamas apologists parading around American universities and American cities has to give anybody pause of how many of Hair-minded people have we allowed into America, and we've made them citizens. So, 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 so the Israeli, the IDF, immediately announced they're buying ten thousand additional carbines to arm up and protect those people living in the south. Um, it's not just in the south, but even in the West Bank. You know, there's 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 a lot of inter inter movement between Israel and the West Bank between right. the citizens there. So it, there's a lot of chances for additional problems when a ground offensive starts. So citizens were, were vulnerable with Extremely their cell phones, vulnerable. with their cell phones. And they were disarmed. And, and without firearms. Correct. Right, so double whammy. Yes. Except, and the, and living, the few, living, living next to a neighbor that wants to exterminate them. Wants to destroy them. Uh, and the kibbutzes, the rare exception was the kibbutz who had their own, basically their own community watch. Yes. That was armed. 10, 12, 14 people, some men, some women, right. but as long as they can move and communicate and you can disrupt the enemy momentum, uh, they survived intact. Uh, the ones that were the, where they breached and they, and they took over, the, you, you, I'm sure people have seen the pictures, it's, it's too gruesome. Well, look, this has been an incredible conversation in Israel. We've got a lot more to dig into on our next episode. But for now, we are off leash with Eric Prince. Thanks for joining us.